Welcome to our live stream this morning. Thank you for your patience as we continue to figure things out this week. We're excited about worshiping together and we're thankful that we can do that. And so um, uh, Autumn is going to be uh, leading us in a, uh, a time of um, worship this morning. So thank you, Autumn, for doing that. Absolutely. All right, let's, um, let's join together. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. So glad you're here together. We're all together in our living rooms or wherever we're at in our comfies. Yeah. Um, and let's just invite the Lord um, into this place and acknowledge his presence among us. So, Father, we welcome you this morning. It's good, Father, to be in your presence. It's good to be with one another. We want to set our hearts and our minds on you and your truth. Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for another week, making it through another week in this time. We want to thank you, Father, for all the goodness and all the blessings um, that you've given us, Lord. We're grateful for who you are, God, and how you've been moving in our lives uh, during this season. So, Father, we want to take this time to remember who you are, to remember what you've done in our lives and how you're, you're actively moving and engaged with us uh, each day. And we want to return our thanks, Father, by praise and worship, Lord, mm -hmm. this morning. And may it be a sweet sound to your ear. Amen. Amen. Let's sing. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name.
a minute um, with your families or with whoever you're with or just hanging out with your by yourself. You just want to take a moment to just share, acknowledge out loud something that you are thankful for that the Lord has done for you this week in a way that he's shown up for you or for others that you know. Um, God is moving and he is working right now. And um, we're encouraged by the power of our testimony. So take a moment and just share um, right now with um Psalm 145, it says, The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. Father, when we think about your goodness towards us, Lord, whether we deserve it or not, because we're not worthy of your goodness, what else do we have left to do, Father, but to stand and to give you our hearts, to give you our love, to give you our worship, to give you our all? This morning, that's what we do in our worship together, Lord. So we want to pour out our love on you, Lord. We want to renew and reaffirm our commitment, Father, to you as our God and as our King.
We take a moment, Lord, in this stillness, God, to quiet our hearts and to open our hands, Lord, and open our hearts to you. Say, Father, come and have your way. You are our good thing, Lord. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Amen. Well, thank you, Otter, for leading us in worship this morning, and thank you, God, for your assuring presence today. Uh, we can't help but be distracted because of the news around the world. It's not good. It's a bit overwhelming, God, and so forgive us for taking our eyes off of you because it truly is you that is the antidote for our suffering we see all around us. Lord, forgive me for not always seeking you first. Forgive us for not turning to you. And so from the message, I wanna share these words this morning. God, the one and only, I'll wait as long as God says, everything I need comes from him, so why not? He's a solid rock under my feet. He's breathing room for my soul. He's an impregnable castle and I'm set for life. My help and glory are in God, so trust God absolutely. Trust him, people. Lay your lives on the line for him. God is a safe place to be. God said this once and for all. How many times have I heard it repeated? Strength comes straight from God. So we pray that you would hear us, Lord. I wanted to be able to uh, share with you uh, a couple of um, 
announcements. And um, so they're going to be uh, scrolling along here uh, right beside me uh, in a minute. Uh, so one of those things is about life groups. And so I just wanted to let you know that people are meeting and they're meeting virtually. And, um, you know, it's ex exciting to be able to hear the stories and to see what God is doing um, through this new space. So uh, we would encourage you to join a life group and you can hop on our website and, and check that out. We also have, uh, if you're on our website and you're looking at the live stream, uh, you'll see a few new buttons there. One is for prayer and one is for care. Uh, that's the way we kind of submit our requests now. So if you could um, submit through that, we'd love to be able to, to have you join us so we can still pray for you and we can still see how we're able to meet those needs. Um, also, some of you have asked, hey, how do we, um, how can we still remain generous? And that is uh, in a variety of ways. One is uh, you have resources, you, you yourself are resources, you have neighbors, uh, reach out to your neighbors and be generous to them. Um, also, we want to continue on our mission. Uh, so we have a place for you to be able to uh, to give there. And then um, some who uh, are not comfortable with giving online can just uh, uh, mail in um, what God is leading you to be able to provide. So thank you for your generosity. Uh, we also have a few resources for you um, on our live streaming page you can sign up for Right Now Media. And so there are over 30 categories of things you can look at. Uh, there's thousands and thousands of videos and, and, and training for you to be able to do. A lot of our life groups are using that and you can use that yourself as well. So we, we would ask you to be able to um, just sign up for that. It's free for you. And then as part of uh, discipleship uh, and families and for your children, uh, we have this thing called um, a Digital Pass and that's a, a free digital pass. It's from Lifeway. Uh, it's been twin tested, so uh, Isaac and Silas and I have been working on that uh, together. Uh, it's a great way for you to be able to uh, disciple your kids. So I wanted to let you know about those few things. Um, I'm going to pray for uh, Andre and um, uh, before he begins. So uh, that's our announcements. Uh, let's pray. We ask Holy Spirit that you would speak through Andre today, and we thank you for the message you have given him. Amen. God bless you all. All right. Hey, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Wanted to uh, say hi to you as well from our living room. Thank you, Autumn, for leading us. And, and Dave, there are a few other things I wanted everyone to be aware of. I got an email yesterday that Lakeside Christian Camp, which we've been frequenting now for 40 years. Uh, we had an all-church retreat there for 30 years. Yesterday, I found out that they're going to be closing this week after 40 years of ministry. So uh, just for those of you who don't know about that, I know it was a, a precious place for a lot of us. Um, so that's sort of a bitter, bittersweet news we got there, but I wanted to share that with you. Also, uh, a couple other things. Um, next week, we are going to do the Lord's Supper. So just want to give you a heads up to make sure you have the elements with you next week, uh, bread and drink. And we're going to partake of that just before I share the sermon. So uh, think about that for next Sunday. Um, also, another family note, we found out that the Willettes, Jesse Miranda Willette, had a little baby. Yay, here's a couple pictures of her. Her name is Lennon June Willette. She was born on Wednesday, nine pounds, four ounces. So a healthy baby. Really excited for you guys. Uh, really happy. Look how cute. You just want to kiss those cheeks. Oh, I love it. You got to love it. So even in the midst of what's going on, joyful things are happening. So really excited about that. And also Dave was talking about the importance of connecting with each other. And I just wanted to share with you a couple screenshots I took of some encouraging times I had. This is my friend, Daniel Lannon. Uh, every Wednesday morning we get together at eight o'clock. We've been doing that for months. And we're, we, we've been going through the Bible from Genesis. We're up into Second Kings now. And we're just, we're just reading the scripture together and it's really encouraging. So just if you're not doing something like that, I encourage you to uh, find a friend and say, hey, how about we connect once a week at this time? Also wanted to show you another screenshot I took of a great meeting we had the other night with our life group. Here's all the people from our life groups. By the way, people gave me permission to show these pictures. Um, but we had such a good time on Thursday night and we spent the time just hearing what's up with everyone and praying for each other. And I did also get permission to share this. One of our uh, members, the Harris's, Jeff Harris's 
told us about how his brother had passed away just this past week from coronavirus. And um, so it was a special time over, um, you know, over our life group time to be able to pray for each other in a time like this, because he can't go be with the family, obviously, right now, which is painful. But he could virtually be with us, and we mourned with those who mourn. So again, let's find ways to keep connected during this time. All right. With that said, let's go ahead into this week's message. You know, times like these are what make us think about what really matters and actually what's really real. I want you to listen now to a story that I got off of a Facebook post about some doctors in an Italian hospital. This uh, one particular doctor posted this. She said, until two weeks ago, my colleagues and I were atheists. It was normal because we're doctors and we were taught that science excludes the presence of God. I laughed at my parents going to church. Well, nine days ago, a 75-year-old pastor was admitted into the hospital. He was a kind man. He had serious breathing problems. He had a Bible with him and he impressed us by how he read it to the dying as he held their hand. We doctors are all tired, discouraged, psychologically and physically finished. When we had time, we listened to him reading the Bible. We've reached our limits. We can do no more. People are dying every day. We are exhausted. We have two colleagues who've died and others have been infected. We realize that we needed to start asking God for help. This is beyond us. When we do this, we do this when we have a few free minutes. When we talk to each other, we can't believe that though we were once fierce atheists, we are now daily in search of peace, asking the Lord to help us continue so we can take care of the sick. Yesterday, the 75-year-old pastor died. Despite having had over 120 deaths here in three weeks, we were destroyed. He had managed, despite his condition and our difficulties, to bring us a peace that we no longer had hoped was possible. The pastor went to the Lord and soon will follow him if matters continue like this. I haven't been home for six days. I don't know when I ate last. I'm realizing my worthlessness on earth. I want to use my last breath to help others. I'm happy to have returned to God while I'm surrounded by the suffering and death of my fellow men. Oof, what a powerful post. What a powerful post. People are realizing what life is really all about. That's what happens when, when, when death, the, the, the great equalizer, is at our doorstep. But look at, I want you to pay attention to what an impact just one person can have. Atheists returning to God. Why? Because they saw the reality of God through the kindness of one man. One anonymous old man. In a world of great uncertainty and fear, hope usually comes through quiet heroes like this old pastor. We're in a sermon series on the Gospel of Mark called Jesus More Than Enough. And today I've entitled my sermon, Quiet Heroes. In our passage this morning, we're going to see some people making an impact in quiet ways. These aren't the kind of people we normally think about when we think about the Bible. And as we do this this morning, I'd like to get, invite you. Um, if you're on Facebook, just type in to the Facebook uh, post the answer to this question. Free, from your life experience, oh, I said for your life experience. It should be from your life experience, sorry. Who is a quiet hero and why? Who's been a quiet hero in your life? And, and why would you call them a quiet hero? Just post that in the comments. And um, I can't read the comments with the technology I'm using, but I think you can enjoy that as you just listen to the message this morning and see the various heroes that people bring up. Well, I'd like the rest of us, if we could, please turn our Bibles to Mark chapter 15. And uh, we're going to be in verse 40 this morning. Mark 15, if you don't have a Bible, by the way, you can go on, uh, if you've got your computer right there, or your phone, BibleGateway.com. BibleGateway.com is a great place to go and uh, read the Bible. 
Um, now, just to get us in context, last week we saw Jesus being crucified by the Romans and darkness descended upon Jesus. And we talked about how God was pouring out his righteous judgment on sin and Jesus was bearing our sin. He was paying the debt we owed God. Finally, around 3 p.m., we found that Jesus cried out in a loud voice, to tell us die, meaning it is finished. And to tell us die was a word that was used. It was, a, it was a, a, um, a term, a marketplace term, and people would put paid in full on, on bills when debts were paid. But Jesus paid our debt. And having completely paid the debt we owed God for disobeying him, he then said to the Father, the very last thing, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, and he died. And the Roman centurion who was standing nearby, talk about an atheist, he was amazed by all he saw. And he said, surely this man was the son of God. Indeed. That's where we left off. And we find that he wasn't the only one there. Verse 40, if you're reading along with me. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James the Younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. Now, I just want you to take a moment to try to connect to how these women, from a distance, what they would be going through, what they would be feeling, looking up at Jesus on the cross. Jesus had been everything to them. They had left their homes in Galilee, a hundred miles away on foot. They'd been traveling with him for months, years, and, and with his disciples and caring for his needs and their needs, they were deeply connected to and committed to Jesus. We can't miss that. Just, just as an example of the three women named here, Mary Magdalene, she had been demon possessed according to scripture. She'd been leading a miserable life. And Jesus exercised, according to scripture, seven demons out of her. Imagine what Jesus meant to her. By the way, she's often called a prostitute, but that's an assumption. That scripture never says that. She's also called Jesus' mistress in the Da Vinci Code book and movie. But again, there's no credible scholarly basis for that opinion. No, this woman was a transformed woman. She met Christ and her life changed on a dime. But now he's dead. The one who had meant everything to her was now dead. How could that be? And she wasn't alone, along with the... Mary and Salome, we read it in, in verse 41, many other women had come up. And he had meant a lot to all of them, more than we realize, because in that patriarchal culture, it was amazing how Jesus treated women. Here's what one scholar had to say about that. By the standards of the religiously strict, it would have been scandalous for women, especially married women, to travel with an entourage of male disciples. Palestine. Palestinian women were expected to limit their public activity, keep their heads covered, and fulfill their domestic duties, barefoot in the kitchen. In this one verse, Mary hint, Mark hints at an aspect of Jesus' ministry that potently challenges the social order, especially if these women followed as disciples, which they presumably did. So tapping into that cultural understanding, the Jesus is everything to, the, to, to these women. So it goes without saying, the depth of pain they would be experiencing. How could he be dying? The one who had, who had done so many miracles and had transformed their lives. What now? That's a good question. I want you to realize that these women had no power to do anything legally or religiously. They had no power to rescue Jesus. They had no power whatsoever, they, even physically powerless. Have you ever felt hopeless while loved ones are suffering around you and there's nothing you could do like right now with this coronavirus? They seemingly could do nothing, but they did what they could, which is they were there. They were there. They were quiet heroes simply by being present in Jesus's crucial hour. So our first point this morning is be present to those around you. Quiet heroes are those who are present to those around them. Listen, the, the ministry of presence is much more powerful than we think. And it's easier said than done. I struggled with anxiety throughout my life. And when I used to, be, when I was a young pastor and I would go on counseling visits, 
I'd panic a bit because I wasn't sure what to do or say. I'd fumble around and sometimes I'd make things worse and I would end up focusing more on am I messing up than on comforting the person. Then I went to seminary and I took a class on counseling. I, I remember our counseling professor who was a counselor herself. She kept saying this one uh, statement over and over, be a non-anxious presence, be a non-anxious presence. Say it with me right now. Be a non-anxious presence. That has served me so well over the years. I remember years ago, there was a woman in our church who had lost her husband. And I went to visit her, and she was completely distraught. I mean, she was distraught. And she was saying all kinds of wrong things about God. And, and initially, my impulse was the pastor. Well, I got to correct her. Well, that's not true. No, 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 you can't say that. Can you say not helpful? Well, instead, I had to I remember what my prof said. I resisted the temptation to correct her wrong statements. And I remember what my prof said, be a non-anxious presence. And so I, I let it go, focused on her and the Lord, and I just let her vent. And when she was done, I'm sure she was expecting me to go into a mini sermon or bring a Bible, bunch of Bible verses. Instead, I went over to her. And I just held her without saying a word. At first she was stiff because, you know, I kind of represented God and she's mad at God at that point in time. But then like ice cream on a hot day, she just melted and started to burst into tears. Years later, she told me how meaningful that moment was to her. You know, quiet heroes don't have to do anything. Sometimes the ministry of presence is enough. Now, some of you are saying, well, that's ironic. We're in the middle of a time where we can't be in each other's presence. But that's what the point I'm making. You know, I, I'm, I was telling my wife yesterday, I feel like I want to do something. I want to go out and, I don't know, create ventilators. I do, I, I, and it ends up that I, I, you know, we, we don't realize that sometimes what seems to be the simplest, almost powerless thing can actually be a very powerful thing. And right now we're being told that simply staying in our homes and isolating is, is serving others. But it seems like it isn't. That's my point. These women are just standing there. What are they doing? You do what you can instead of focusing on what you can't. And right now, we're ministering to people just by being in our homes. But don't miss the ministry of presence. I showed you those pictures earlier. We were there with Jeff when he was mourning over his brother's death virtually. So. We can have a virtual presence in prayer spiritually and virtually right now. Don't underestimate that. Well, the women weren't the only ones who were there as Jesus died on the cross. Verse 42. It was preparation day. That is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus's body. It was preparation day, the day before the Sabbath. It was called preparation day because according to Jewish law, once the Sabbath hit at 6 p.m., that's the way they did their days, sundown. Sundown on Friday night, 6 p.m. would be the beginning of Sabbath. You couldn't do any work on the Sabbath. They wouldn't be able to do anything uh, with the body after 6 p.m. Once 6 p.m. hit, all business concluded. You had to make enough food on the preparation day before 6 p.m. or preparation, enough food for two days. You had to, you know, make sure your lamps were going to burn for two days. And so if they were going to bury Jesus, it had to happen before 6 p.m. And we were told he died at 3 p.m. They only had a couple hours. Now, the need was even more urgent than we realized. Not only was they only had, did they only have a few hours and then they couldn't do anything. But the Romans didn't respect criminals executed on a cross. And so typically what the Romans would, if no one was there, if Jesus died after 6 p.m., they would just leave the body to be carrying for wild animals, or they would throw the body in a common grave. So it was urgent that they get their hands on Jesus' body before, in enough time, to get him off the cross and give him a decent burial. Short time. But who? Who can possibly have enough influence with the Romans to be able to do something? And that's where we find an unlikely person. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council. What's the council? The Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin are the ones who gathered together and said, 
we want to kill Jesus. They've been after Jesus. Of all the people that's going to minister to Jesus now, a Pharisee? Really? Now, why didn't he speak up in the Sanhedrin? We saw that a chapter ago when they decided as a group to kill Jesus. There's no mention of Joseph saying anything. Well, it seems like he's speaking up now. He's doing something now. Mark tells us that he was waiting for the kingdom of God. Doesn't mean that he's a follower of Jesus. Because actually, Jesus seems to have failed, right? The king is dead. But John gives us insight into what this means. John tells us this. Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. And Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrhs and aloes, about 75 pounds. So what we see is that Joseph was himself a follower of Jesus, but secretly, quietly, out of fear of the other leaders. He and another Pharisee turned secret believer, Nicodemus, come, and together they use what influence they have to ask Pilate for the body of Jesus. They use their, their celebrity currency, if you will. They use what they have. Now, verse 43 says that he, they came and he went boldly to Pilate. And my question was, well, what, what was so bold about asking Pilate for a dead body? Well, there's actually several reasons. Here's a few that I found. Number one, safety. Remember, Jesus has been implicated here as, as a traitor to, to Rome. You don't want to associate with a traitor. So he's actually, this is jeopardizing his safety, purity. The Jews consider if you touch a corpse, you're unclean, which means he's going to be unclean uh, during the Sabbath and into the Passover festival. So there's a religious cost he's paying. His position, he'll probably be expelled from the Sanhedrin if he's now showing dignity to the one at the Sanhedrin, condemned as blasphemous. And then his reputation, the whole crowd has turned against Jesus at this point. There's a lot. Jo Joseph and Nicodemus have a lot to lose by asking for Jesus' body, and yet they do. Now, yes, they didn't speak up when they were debating Jesus in the Sanhedrin, but better late than never. And yet time's running short, as I said, only a few hours. Pilate delays the answer on top of this. Take a look at this in verse 44. It says that Pilate, when they went to Pilate, Pilate was surprised to hear that Jesus was already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. And when he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. Pilate is surprised. Why? Well, because, as I said last week, it usually took two to three days for people to die for crucifixion. He sent the centurion, a professional soldier, who's checked on dead bodies a million times to confirm Jesus' death. The centurion has to leave the palace go to the site, check on the body, and come back. All this is delay. But he does, and he finds out Jesus has died. Now, that's huge. Don't miss this. This will come up in two weeks when we get to Easter and the resurrection. This is a professional soldier, a centurion. He knows how to confirm a death. Over the centuries, enemies of Christianity have suggested, you know, Jesus didn't really die. He just swooned. Or it seemed like he died, but then he was resuscitated later. Later, This passage tells us a centurion validated he was dead, Roman certified. So, having obtained the body, verse 46, so Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of, jo of Joseph, saw where he was laid. All right. Having obtained permission to take the body, Joseph, with just a little time, he's probably running, runs from Pilate's palace out into the marketplace, buys some linen cloth, goes back to Golgotha, takes down the body, which would have taken some time. It wouldn't have been easy. And it's getting dark. Then they would have wrapped it in the linen, probably with the women helping. This was the custom and using the, the, the spices to um, deal with the, the smell of decomposition. And then they would have taken it over to the tomb, which Matthew, Matthew tells us it was Joseph's own new tomb. And then they would have placed him in there. Now, clearly Joseph was not expecting a resurrection or he wouldn't have gone through all this, right? He's just showing uh, respect for Jesus, but he's also showing great faith at this point 
by even associating with Jesus. Finally, once they got the body in the tomb, they rolled a huge stone against the entrance to secure it. By the way, I, I, this is interesting. These stones were normally rolled down a slanted track to make it hard to move because you'd have to move it up, up, that, up that slanted track and it'd be almost impossible. And notice then in the very last verse this morning that the women are still there, most likely helping with the burial. By the way, just a cultural note here. If you go to Jerusalem today, like I did a couple of years ago, people are often taken to this place, the garden tomb, and they're told that this is where Jesus was buried. However, archaeologists have proven that this, this tomb dates to the Iron Age, hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus, and we know that it was a new tomb, so it couldn't be this, although it looks the part. <laughs> it probably looks something like this. But where it actually is no longer looks like this. Most people believe far and away what tradition has always said, that where Jesus died is where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre now stands, which is a huge, ornate church built by Emperor Constantine in AD 333. Actually, recent scientific carbon dating done by National Geographic, they sponsored it, has verified that all of this goes back to 333. And when they went, this little building you're seeing in the middle, in there is where you can go, you can actually was sealed for a long time. But they went in there to where the actual stone is that they think Jesus was buried. And uh, it goes back to, to Jesus' time. So this is most likely exactly where Jesus was buried. But regardless, what matters is not the archaeology. Although that's important to us because what it tells us is that the Bible's not a myth. It's, it's based in history. But what really matters to us today is discipleship. Because you've got two unlikely disciples here, Pharisees, quietly standing up for Jesus and burying him with dignity. They were quiet heroes. So our second point this morning is that quiet heroes teach us to be eager to meet needs around you. And they did that by doing what they could. We're told that Joseph was wealthy and prominent. He used those well for the sake of Jesus. He had influence and he used that to pursue Pilate. He had money, so he bought the linen cloth. He had a tomb, so he gave it up for Jesus. He did what he could. You know, when we're met with overwhelming situations, it's common to think, well, what can I do? I mean, like this coronavirus, right? But that, even in times like this, there's things we can do, like our friend, Edeline Eddy. Edeline is a young woman in our church who makes stress balls to deal with anxiety. It's been very helpful to her. And so she's made a business out of it. And this week, she learned that her father has passed away in Haiti. A day after finding that out, Edeline, in, even in her grief, was still thinking of others. She gifted 80 of her stress balls to Geisler's Grocery Store to thank them for staying open and serving the community while most of us are staying home. You see, Edeline is doing what she can. I was talking to another person in our church this week who's good with finances, and she helps the elderly by enabling them to lower their expenses. And she told me this week that she had several chances to bless people in the midst of this crisis. She's doing what she can. And so the question for all of us is, what do I have to offer to Christ? Uh, hopefully some of you have been typing into Facebook, some of your quiet heroes, all of them doing what they can, whatever little thing it may be. Remember, Jesus is the one who can take a just a little basket of loaves and fishes and feed multitudes. Focus on what you can do, not what you can't. Finally, I think it's interesting that after 15 chapters of Jesus' ministry, we've been going through the Gospel of Mark since September 2018, okay, a year and a half. In that time, we've barely heard about the women. They've come up like twice. The Pharisees have been against Jesus the whole time. And so who would we expect at the end of the story when Jesus is dying? Who would we expect to be there? The ones who have been in the story the entire 15 chapters, the disciples, and yet... Where are they? They're not there. Instead, two Pharisees and some women we barely heard about are there. And that, to me, that, that, that is a point from silence. The fact that disciples aren't mentioned here is something we got to learn from. My last point this morning is simply this. Quiet heroes teach us to be willing to identify with Jesus. Listen, there's a good quiet that serves others and glorifies God, and there's a bad quiet that seeks to protect ourselves. Sometimes our quiet 
is selfish, and that's what we're seeing in the disciples. But quiet heroes are willing to identify with Jesus. That 75-year-old pastor who loved on people as he died in an, in an Italian hospital showed the reality of God, how he was willing to identify with Jesus. That's what pointed the doctors back to God. It turned atheists back into believers. Listen, those of us who know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we have a great opportunity in this present crisis to point people to the only true hope of the world, the one who has conquered what we fear, death. His name is Jesus. Have you identified with him lately? Social media is a great avenue for doing that. And I know many of us are a little hesitant to put anything out there because all sorts of people see it, old high school friends or whatever. But have you thought about going out and making a bold statement of faith in Christ on Instagram or Facebook? I mean, why not? As someone said to me the other day, if we can't be bold now, then when? People, people are looking for hope and we have it in Jesus, but it's not in ourselves, it's in him. We have to point people to him. Let's not be quiet cowards like the disciples, but quiet heroes like these women and like Joseph and like another Joseph. I want to end with a story here this morning. Years ago, there was a family that had to move to a new state because they were struggling financially and emotionally. And the, the, the parents' marriage was in the middle of falling apart. They thought a move might help. So they moved. In the midst of all of the pressure and anxiety of a move and everything you know, being so difficult in their lives, uh, the mother, the woman, went to get her driver's license. And when she went, she ended up being tested by this really gruff guy and she just froze and flunked. Well, it was a straw that broke the camel's back, and this woman ended up in the middle of the DMV just breaking down in tears. Well, there was a man there who noticed her crying, and so he walked up to her and asked her what was wrong. Now, he could have just kept focused on his work, but he went over to help her. And she told him in broken English, because um, she's from another country, how she had flunked the road test and then went into everything that was wrong in her life. It just all came out like a dam. This woman was in despair. Well, this man spoke her language, actually. And then in her language, he said, come back next week and ask for me, and I'll give you the test. And she did. And he calmly gave her the test very, very gently, and she passed with flying colors. Relieved, and upon getting her license, she went back into the DMV before leaving to thank him for helping her. When she did, he said to her, I'd like to invite you to the group that meets at my house on Friday nights. It's a prayer group. We'd love for you and your husband to join us. Well, that couple went and it changed their lives. It actually changed my life too, because I'm telling you about my parents. That couple was my parents and that man's name was Joseph. Joseph Lamont. Now, when I say that name, I don't think there's anyone out there who has any connection with Joseph Lamont. No one knew him. There was no big celebration when he died. He's just an anonymous DMV worker. A few months later, Joseph died to no big fanfare. Just another guy. I think it was about six months later he passed away. Timing was impeccable. But shortly afterwards, because of that prayer group, my mother placed her trust in Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. And our entire family's destiny pivoted that day. I wouldn't be here telling you about Jesus if it wasn't for a man in the DMV who did what he could. Our family's destiny changed that day in the natural DMV when a quiet hero did three things. He was present, he did what he could, and he identified with Jesus. If you look at those three points again I made earlier, he was present, he did what he could, he identified with Jesus. And I pray that we would be willing and eager to be quiet heroes who point people to the only hope we have, Jesus Christ. If you've never accepted him as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you to do that. There's a button on our live stream page. You can find out more about Jesus, the hope of the world, like those doctors are finding in Italy. We'd love to introduce you to him. If you know him, then get busy being present doing what you can, and identify with Jesus. Lord, I pray as we go into worship this last song that you would help us to let you speak to our hearts. And Lord, I pray that you would give us the peace that surpasses understanding that only comes to those who know you. 
We love you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for being present in our lives. Help us to quietly be present in others. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's finish with the song. Autumn. sure Autumn can hear us. Can Autumn hear us?
We're so grateful that you have joined us today. And uh, Lord God, I just pray that this message that you gave Andre, that it would continue to speak to our hearts. Let your word, let your word ring true in our hearts. May we remember it. May we go throughout the day and just be in worship for who you are. You are a God who saves you, our salvation. In you, we can completely trust. And so we love you for that. Let us love you and love one another. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. And uh, thanks for joining us today. Bless you all.